Hello and welcome everyone to this event. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about Where Are the Women Tonight with author Sarah Sheridan. If you've got any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat below and we'll see what we can get through this evening. My name is Christine. I'm part of the publications team at Historic Environment Scotland. And I'm very pleased to introduce tonight Sarah Sheridan, who's an author of fiction and non-fiction with the fascination for uncovering women in history. Now, tonight they'll be discussing the publication Where Are the Women? A Guide to and Imagine Scotland, which is now out in paperback. Um, and now in this book, we imagine a different Scotland, a Scotland where real women and their untold stories are commemorated in fictionalised memorials, landmarks, street names all over the country. So, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hi there. Hi, Sarah. And um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the idea behind this book? and how you went about creating this um, alternative version of Scotland. Yeah, so it, it originally was a, a, an author in America called Rebecca Solnit, who's a feminist writer, who had remapped the New York subway. Um, and she had told the story of, uh, of, of New York through the story of the women uh, rather than the men, because there are no New York subway stops uh, named after women. And, and I had written a book called, uh, been part of a book, one of your books, uh, called Bloody Scotland. Um, and I had been doing a tour with some of the other authors at various different historic environments, Scotland places. And when I came home, I had a go at your publisher, Jamie. And I said, Jamie, there's not enough women uh, in, in, in your properties. And he went off and had a look and came back and said, yeah, that's absolutely right. There isn't. And what do you want to do about it? And we had both seen this project by Rebecca Solnit. And it was Jamie's suggestion. Jamie said, why don't, why don't you do that? And I, the very first thing that crossed my mind was the Glasgow sub subway. Would I do the Clockwork Orange? Mm -hmm. and, and then Jamie was like, why don't you do the country? And I just remember this moment of like thinking, oh, God, could I actually do that? Like, what a huge job it would be. Um, so I went home. I, I said yes immediately, despite the fact that I was a little bit freaked out because I thought it was such a brilliant idea and such a huge opportunity. Um, came home and there was no sleep for days. I was sitting there trying to sort of plan out how I would do this book and what would be the best mm -hmm. way to do it. And Jamie gave me an amazing free reign. I mean, I could have done 10 women or 50 women or 70 women. But as you know, because you had to deal with me for the whole of the year, um, we finally ended up with around 1,200 women. And, and the reason for that was once I started looking into some of the time periods that I was less familiar with, I realised how many women there were. And it really became a bit of a crusade for me to get in as many uh, stories. I had, a, I had a tagline for myself, which was no lady left behind, that we could mm -hmm. tell as many stories as possible and, and really reflect the way that. The, our built environment and rural environment are gendered currently um, in, 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 a, in, in, in a kind of um, realistic way. So as there are lots and lots and lots of men, we could tell them, use it to tell the stories of lots and lots and lots of women. Yes, I mean, the book has great historical breadth, but also great geographical breadth as well. So it goes from the borders right up to Shetland. And I was wondering if there was any traits that you found were kind of recurring in certain areas or if there was anything that was universal, no matter whereabouts in Scotland um, these women were from or were living at that time. Oh, yeah, both of these things, actually. One of the things that struck me, because I learned a huge amount in doing the research for the book and writing the book, was that um, our built environment and our economic environment really dictate some of people's choices. So when I was looking at the history of women in Edinburgh or in Glasgow or in Aberdeen or in Dundee, these women or generally women had different opportunities and different worlds available to them. So you would find, for example, in Dundee, perhaps more working class poets quite early on because they were working in the factories and they had some money and that meant that pamphlets could be produced and um there were other women who wanted to read their work who also had money so they could sub they could buy these pamphlets um so yeah and a lot of uh, labor activists in glasgow uh, and things like opera singers in aberdeen and in edinburgh and dancers and dramatists because a lot of the theater was in was in edinburgh in particular particularly early on so um yeah that was really interesting how much it defined you'd look at somebody and think well you're an opera singer but if you're in glasgow would you've been in the music hall or if you were yeah. here you've done something else um so that was certainly something that i learned but there were some movements, if you like, that really took in everyone, among them the suffragettes, of course, with suffragettes from everywhere, um, and the Scottish Women's Hospitals. There were volunteers for the Scottish Women's Hospitals from all over the country. So, yeah, I think both of these things were actually true. Mm -hmm. 
And when you were, um, or maybe since you've researched the book, are there any individual women or maybe groups of women who have really stuck with you, you know, really stayed in your head over that time? Lots and lots and lots. I mean, I, I kind of, I was already a campaigner. I was already an equality campaigner, really, at, at the time where I started writing the book. I am now sort of much more radicalised almost. <laughs> Um, because I realised how many women's stories I didn't know and it was a subject that I am interested in and that I write about regularly and when I was dipping into areas of history that I don't normally read about I realised how many women we you know we have missed out so I think it's a book that that I loved writing but it actually made me quite angry I'd be walking along George Street in Edinburgh because in Edinburgh I mean we're not worse in Edinburgh actually than anywhere else but because I was in Edinburgh Mm -hmm. um, there are, we might as well use the, the stat. There's more um, statues, for example, to named animals in Edinburgh than there are statues to named women in Edinburgh. And so I've been walking along George Street where there are six statues to men and, and one statue to a dog. And, um, and, and I would be just getting angrier as I was walking along the street. And I think my anger was about, you know, being brought up in Edinburgh and thinking, well, you know, I've been walking along the street for years and I hadn't realised the sort of subliminal effect that those... Uh, statues were were having on me and I, I, I just kept thinking if I'm walking on one side of the street and my brother is walking on the other side of the street he sees people who look like him everywhere he sees people mm -hmm. who are honoured everywhere and whose stories are told uh, and, and so I felt very angry for for young me and also for younger people who you know aren't being taught these stories and aren't being told particularly younger women aren't being told that you know they can achieve things and and you can do something worthy of a statue and it's always, of course, much more difficult to be the first to do anything. So if you feel you're the first, that's especially tricky. Yeah, I mean, I think what's really amazing in the book is no matter what your interest is, whether it's the arts or science or sport or education, there's huge threads of women who have sort of specialised or really innovated in these areas for hundreds and hundreds of years. Yeah. And you can see that throughout the book. It's so frustrating. And, and, and then people would say, when I was writing the book, I would tell people I was writing this book and they would say, oh, yeah, you know, they'd say they'd say, oh, Mary Somerville or one person or two women that they'd maybe heard of. Um, uh, and, and oh, yeah, so you're going to put up two statues then because those were the two women you've heard of. And, and I chose in the end a thousand two hundred women. But I actually I mean, you were very strict with me and you had to be by the end because that book would have been damn long. <laughs> if we if, if you'd let me have my way because I, I I could have put in double that number you know yep. there were so many there just was a real breath and I, I think it made me really realize that we come from a whole um sort of generation upon generation upon generation of these amazing women um whose stories just really aren't shared aren't told and, and when they are told they're almost told apologetically so yeah. I just before the book came out, I met a, a woman in Glasgow and we were chatting and, and, and I was telling her about this, you know, all these writers I found in particular, the mm. writers I hadn't heard of. And she said, my granny was a writer. And I said, oh, what was her name? And she told me the name. And I said, she's in the book. And this, this woman said, oh, yeah, you know, she just, she just, she was big in America. And I said to her, your granny cracked the most difficult market in the world. Yeah. And you listen to what you just said about her. <laughs> this is part of it. You know, we are so kind of swimming in this water of understatement um, uh, where these where we're sort of constantly playing down uh, female stories and, and our inheritance from, from that mm -hmm. side of our families. Absolutely. And um, just a quick reminder, if anyone's just joined us, do feel free to put any questions in the chat below and we'll get around to those um, throughout the event. Um, Sarah, out of the thousand plus women that you included in the book are there any that are kind of personal favorites or are this month's personal favorites that you would like to remind us of um i love catherine carswell she's a glasgow woman and she was in um in correspondence with dh lawrence she got fired i think from glasgow herald for um for reviewing women in love which was then banned mm -hmm. So yeah, Catherine Carswell definitely, and she wrote the first kind of warts and all biography of Burns, and was sent a bullet in the post um, because she had questioned the kind of Burns legacy. So mm. Catherine Carswell certainly um, a big favourite of mine. Uh, Jane Henning, 
uh, World War II heroine who ran a, a, an orphanage in Budapest and went back at the beginning of World War II uh, and ended up dying in, in Auschwitz, I think, in one of the concentration camps. Mm. Anyway, she was incredibly brave. Um, she's a missionary, really, in a sense. Sophia Jex Blake, there's a, a, a plaque on, on a house, private plaque, nobody's put it up other than the people that live in the house, to Sophia Jex Blake, who was a very early medical, female medical pioneer. Um, part of the first group of women who um, who graduated from from Edinburgh University of Edinburgh in medicine, or rather didn't graduate. Um, mm -hmm. They did the whole course and then were told they weren't allowed to graduate. So I think she had to go abroad to to graduate. And then writers, always for me, the writers. So uh, Susan Ferrier um, and and Mary Brunton, both of them kind of late Georgian, early Victorian writers. Uh, Mary Brunton was in Orkney although she came down to Edinburgh. I love Mary Brunton. I sort of feel like she's gritty Jane Austen. Uh, and we have totally forgotten about her. She was very, her stuff was very, very popular. Um, this image is, is from the Kirk and the Canongate. Gate. Uh, her husband, Alexander Brunton, was a minister and he taught zoology at the university. And also after her death, went on to be the moderator of the Assembly, Church of Scotland Assembly. Um, and so she was in that milieu and she wrote, two and a half novels and then sadly died I think in childbirth in the middle of the third so we only have a fragment of her third but her stuff was very very popular and was translated into French which was kind of one of the the, the things that you judged books on um, mm. in, in yeah. the late Georgian era so yeah I think it, it just felt very it, it feels like we have a lot of sort of very rich legacy from all these different areas in science as you say in the arts and and, and in sport too one of my Favies is uh, Phyllis Wiley, who was an early 20th century woman who went off to America. I think it must have been in the 30s. When she went to America, she went on a boat. Like There was no planes yet. And she played in the Curtis Club, but she was never allowed to come to the Curtis Club dinners at the Old Course in, in St. Andrews. Um, because she was a woman and she wasn't allowed in the club, it wasn't allowed in the clubhouse, <laughs> and she laterally got to go in. I think in two thousand and eight, which was shortly before she died, it was her first shot in the mm -hmm. clubhouse because that's when women were allowed in. So yeah, a bit of a pioneer. That's great. We've got a question from from Inga on YouTube asking, "How did you deal with women who are more well known in Scotland, like Mary Queen of Scots or Mary Mary of Guise? Did you include them or leave them out or give more space to sort of?" unknown women specifically? Um, I, I included them and I included several monuments that actually exist so I didn't I don't think I put up anything new from memory to Mary Queen of Scots but there are actually a number of existing monuments in fact of the very few statues in Edinburgh to named women um, Mary Queen of Scots has one on the facade of the portrait gallery one small one on the Scott monument and I think as well maybe one on St Giles on the outside of St Giles um, so yeah i did include them because i think they contributed um and and also i wanted to create this this very accurate reflection so we have statues to uh, people who are well known kings for example all the, all the people you've mentioned are kind of a part of royalty and therefore part of the ruling class in the medieval era um, and so because we have monuments to the men i wanted to create also monuments to the women so yeah i did mm -hmm. uh, include them good That's question good. <laughs> and we've got a question from Ken on YouTube as well, um, asking about, on well, saying that he's recently heard about a project in Paris to rename or ensure more places are named after women. And he's asking if you've heard of any similar campaigns in Edinburgh or how anything like that could be started. So I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, um, Edinburgh City Council is actually already committed to naming uh, new roads and things uh, uh, for women. However, the issue with this really is that quite often somebody's built a, an, a, an out of town sort of cul-de-sac somewhere and then that gets named after a woman. Mm -hmm. We still have George Street and we still have, you know, all the centre of town, the sort of communal stuff and the stuff that people um, yeah. are, are kind of are most important public spaces, if you like. There's no room for women. So it, it's kind of a two edged sword, but they are making an effort to do that. And I think two years ago now, they named uh, a small track on the meadows after Muriel Spark and um, a close after, I think it's, is it Miss Brodie that they named it after? One of the closest of the grass market is named after, I think it's Miss Brodie. So they are, mm -hmm. they are trying to do something, but the, but the issue around it really is that, you know, 
the centre of our cities, our main public spaces are really already named. And, and that's kind of problematic, I think. So we want to keep pressure on the council that they need to do more. I know at, um, at HES we run, there's a number of plaque schemes, we run a plaque scheme as well, and that when nominations reopen, people can put forward women um, for these schemes as well. And I know this it's been running for about eight years and there has been an increase in number of women that have been put forward for this scheme. So I think sometimes there are things like that as well as um, sort of actual streets and things like that. You can, maybe if you've got good ideas, you can think about that as well. Um, so, um, Sunita on Facebook has asked for a reminder of the name of the, of the name of the writer who sort of inspired to wear the women with the New York subway. Ah, Rebecca and, Solnit, S O L N I T. Rebecca Solnit. She's written loads of books. She's an amazing um, feminist campaigner, actually. So yeah, worth looking up. Yes, and um, we've got one from Cranick and Crowdy on YouTube. If you were able to create and place a statue of a woman in Edinburgh, just one, who would it be, and where would you put it? I think I would take down, first of all, controversially, a statue of David Livingstone in Princess Street Gardens because I just think it's he was just the worst missionary in the world. <laughs> I, I think he was just there because of that great story about him. And um, so I think I would put it somewhere like that, somewhere really central. And I think there would be a number of candidates, actually, that we could look at. Seriously, Sophia Jack's plate being one of them. I mean, there is a plaque to the Edinburgh Seven Sophia, of whom Sophia was one. But her um, her contribution to Edinburgh in particular was really extraordinary. She donated her house to be a hospital. The first uh, woman in children's hospital in Edinburgh was actually Sophia Jakes Blake's house. So yeah, I think it, it's completely worth um, it would be completely worth commemorating her. I'd also say Eliza Wiggum, who um, campaigned against indentured up uh, just after slavery was. Um, uh, abolished. Eliza Wiggum was one of the sort of six transatlantic slavery alliance women who really campaigned to stop uh, indentured uh, slavery um, uh, in America. Um, so yeah, those two women I think would be good candidates. But we're not short. Let me just be absolutely clear: we're not short of amazing foremothers to 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 put statues up to. We've got a. Uh question from Heather on Facebook just asking if there's any Persia women in the books I thought maybe you could say a word of how you've sort of divided or how you've managed to cover all of Scotland within this book and um, there are there's a whole section on Persia and um, in my head I'm scrambling now I can't exactly remember who was in Persia and who wasn't and um, but uh yeah what what I did was I looked at the rough guide and the rough guide um cuts up the country into eight sections and I thought well, I'm not going to do better than the rough guide so I chose their eight sections and then um, did research to populate each of these eight sections so the main um, the main uh, parts and, and they're more or less equal I mean there probably are slightly more women in Glasgow and Edinburgh just because they're kind of population centres uh, and centres of government and or you know all that kind of stuff so yeah there probably are slightly more there but but the sections for all the different areas including the borders and Fife and Perthshire I mean I I made Fife into a queendom rather than a kingdom <laughs> and I think a lot of it was just that it's that kind of semantic and um, just being aware once you're aware of it I warn you you will be enraged you'll be wandering around in a, in a very cross state because once you've realised how pervasively everything is named after men, it, it, it really kind of um, motivates you, actually. Yes, and at the start of each of these sections, we have an illustrated map by Jenny Proudfoot, and these kind of show, they show this fictionalised landscape. And you can imagine we've got the Glasgow one here. You could imagine yourself walking around this alternative Glasgow um, and seeing the different monuments that Sarah you've created and put up to the real women who had a connection with Glasgow. So I think that's also ties into sort of the geography of the book. Um, I was wondering, Sarah, did you find that some areas of research or maybe some groups of women were harder to find out about or research than others? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a certain amount of work that's been done in various academic spheres. So there was very good stats available on witches. Um, mm -hmm. had been done in the University of Edinburgh, there'd been a big um, project and that was available to, uh, publicly available, and so I used that. Um, the National Dictionary of, a Biographical Dictionary of Scottish Women. Um, unfortunately, when I was writing the book, I was, I was on the first edition, there's since been a second edition, and that was really helpful, certainly for women who were kind of uh, academic achievements um, and, and some political achievements and things, they tended to be included in that, but the women who weren't, 
I suppose people who were local midwives or cleaners who were particularly loved. I mean, when you go out in the world, you see a lot of stuff that's named after men from all different areas of life. Mm -hmm. um, and I really wanted to try and pick up, you know, a much loved head teacher and um, somebody who made the tea at a football club and, and perhaps was really well known within the club or um, more recent people as well could be quite difficult. I did quite a lot of work looking at obituaries um, in newspapers um, because, you know, just picking up people from the last 10, 15 years was quite difficult because they quite often, they're not, they're not commemorated anywhere yet. So the only place that they were was in these sort of obituaries. And, and for the paperback, I drew Christine Nuts and um, asked if I could put in some new women because in the intervening year, year and a half since the hardback edition, some new people had died. And so I wanted to include, for example, Polly Higgins, who had been a campaigner to um, uh, to uh, create a, a legal terminology of ecocide. Uh, so she's like mm -hmm. an environmental campaigner, campaigner, campaigning lawyer. And Polly very sadly died quite young of cancer. I knew her. And I wanted to include uh, I wanted to include her in the new edition. And, and I think there's something like I can't remember it was 10 or 12 that we had room for that just I was I was able to I was able to get in. So that so more recent women were difficult. Mm -hmm. And then sort of some communities were quite hidden. So Muslim women were quite difficult to get a hold of. Um, there were some areas of black history which were quite difficult to to come across. Not that there isn't black history or that there isn't, you know, Muslim history, there aren't women doing it, but finding those names and those stories actually turned out to be, you know, a little bit more difficult than, than we would like it to be. And how and we've got a question actually from Carol on Facebook, sort of tying into that, um, asking about non-white women who were included in the book and wondering. What kind of narratives they bring that are either the same or different to other women that are included in the book? Um, well, there's lots of minority communities. I mean, I made a real effort to try and include minority communities in the book, including um, black women, and actually trying to go as early as I could. So I find two black women who were, um, in fact, three black women who were around uh, the royal court in the medieval era. Now, the horrible truth is they were probably kidnapped and brought here or they had been enslaved enslaved in some way I um, we don't have complete records for them but there were two maids and there was a woman who seems to have been some kind of troubadour or a singer something like that um uh, and so I wanted to try and go back as early as I could um, mm -hmm. and that was quite difficult to find but I but managed to do it um so in terms of um you know I I really feel I, I object to the fact that our history is very male, but I also object to the fact that it is very white, um, very Christian, um, and, uh, very, um, uh, very heterosexual, basically. Uh, and I wanted to try and find those other stories whenever I could. And I'm sorry, I don't know offhand, you know, how many from each community. I just did my best to find um, to find mm -hmm. stories from it. Um, I didn't shy away from talking about slavery and Scotland's slaving past. And certainly some of the women who came to live in Scotland after um, being manumission, after being freed. So I found a record for one woman who is buried um, in Edinburgh, actually, uh, in the West End, who it appears came and was a maid for this family who she had belonged to in Jamaica or somewhere like that. I can't remember exactly where she came from. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so trying to be able to tell those stories as well. And from my own community, I, I, my mother's side of my family is Jewish, so I, I did some work on the Jewish community. It's easier in a way because I kind of knew the route in um, and found people that I had never heard of. I, I, I didn't know that um, Annie Anschel, who is an amazing um, uh, psychiatric nurse and who really revolutionized psychiatric nursing within Scotland had come from Austria, I think. Um, so there were several names that I discovered even within my own community. So, yeah, it was quite a difficult job. And, and I contacted groups wherever I could. So if there was an action group about um, about raising profiles of different communities, I would get in touch with them and say, look, do you have any names? And and sometimes the, the answer would come back, no, we've only got men. Yep. <laughs> Which is it's like, oh, that's really annoying. I'm going to have to <laughs> dig a bit deeper. <laughs> yes. Actually, um, a question from um, Chris on Facebook asking, how would you encourage us to explain to children the lack of commemoration of women and what positive messages can we instill in them about a more positive future in this regard? So how would you answer 
<gasps> a child asking a question like that. I suppose, um, I suppose you want just stories that they can really relate to and just start telling them some stories. I do these little threads on Twitter, which mm -hmm. are stories that I think people will be interested in. Um, and quite often they're just little snapshots, you know, because Twitter's not, you don't get very long, but I do just one tweet per woman and say, look, these are women who were early doctors. These are women who, I don't know, whatever you want, women who were in early in, in sport across the whole of the 20th century or whatever. So I'd say it's just about getting the kids to realize that women were, because I think the story that's often told in schools is that women were, you know, staying at home being ladies. Some of them were, but some of them weren't. Some of them were pioneering and doing other things. And um, I think it's really important for all kids to hear those stories because those little boys, that's their that that's their legacy as well. You know, mm -hmm. just as I come from my grandfather and great grandfather, I equally come from my granny and my great grandmother. Um, and so I think it's really important for all kids to understand the sort of breadth of our our, our history. Uh, and really it's through stories. You know, kids yeah. relate to the story. So I guess kind of following on from that is why is it so important then that we not only know about the women from our past, but that we do have that reflected in the built environment? I think it's about honouring their achievements, isn't it? Because if you think of someone like Sophia Jex Blake versus several of the men who have statues um, and, and you think about what that person achieved, you know, putting up a statue in particular is about honouring that person's legacy. And so if you have statues up to people whose legacy isn't really worth honouring for whatever reason, then that is actually really problematic. Actually, because what you're what you're doing is giving honour an honour to somebody who who's who, who maybe shouldn't be doing that. And it's really important, I think, to be honest about our history. And we have a lot of goodies and a lot of baddies. And I often do baddie threads now as well. I do you know terrible women, but we we commemorate all the terrible men. Mm supported slavery and, and and did the highland clearances and you know they've all got statues so what about the women um yeah absolutely um i think yeah i think that's a, a lot to think about definitely um now someone's asked um on pat on facebook has asked well said that they saw you at Cole ross mm -hmm. back at the end of last year yeah. um, and i was wondering about well, says so whether you're doing a second book about witches but i was wondering maybe you could talk a little bit first about the witches that appear in, or the kids witches that appear in Where Are the Women? Yeah, so, I mean, there there are lots of witches. There's more than 3,000 women accused witches um, who were um, who were uh, killed in Scotland um, in about over about 300 years. It really was mostly women. It was about 84, 85% of the, of the deaths were women and, and men really only got, you know, got, got killed if there was a, a witch um if there was a witch panic so somebody in the village got um uh, arrested and then tortured and they said you've got to give us other names that's when men got involved mm -hmm. but largely in Scotland the the witch the witch trials were about women and we do have a few monuments uh, there's one on the class of Esplanade but it's tiny um and so uh, I have been involved with two campaigns, one run by Claire Mitchell QC, which is for uh, the Scottish government to pardon the witches, or the accused witches. And I will be talking with Claire on Sunday. So if you go to my Twitter stream, you'll find a link to that event, which will just all be about the witches because we love our accused witches in Scotland. It's quite a hot topic. Mm -hmm. I think many of us, um, identify perhaps in a way with the witches um, and what happened to them and it was such a huge miscarriage of justice so that's Claire's um, campaign is called uh, Witches of Scotland campaign and there's a petition that you can sign um, and that is now going to the Scottish Parliament to see if they will um, pardon the accused witches and also put up a national monument and then in Fife there's mm -hmm. a, a thing called Raws which is uh, remembering the accused witches of Scotland uh, and they are also looking to put up a, a monument, I think, in, in Fife and get a, an apology from the Kirk because the church, most of the um, most of the uh, 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 accused witches were tried by Kirk sessions. So they were tried in the church and actually only a tiny proportion, I think about 6%, were tried in the High Court in Edinburgh. And that was really the only ones that had enough money to go and get a lawyer. Most witches didn't have that kind of money. Um, and really, if you were in the Kirk Sessions, there was very little chance you would get off. Your best chance of getting away was to escape. And there are some stories of, of witches who escaped. So if we're looking for names, I mean, the, the witch that 
comes to mind most is, is Lilia Sadie, who was um, she was an accused witch, but she actually never got um, she never got sentenced because she died before she could be sentenced. And she's buried on the foreshore just near Curis, which is um, where Pat saying we met was was at the new witch's trail that runs along the, the foreshore there. Um, that you can follow, and that's great that that's that's happening, and 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 that trail, Lilius is included in that in that trail, and um, and secondly, no, I won't be doing a second book just with witches, I don't think, um, but I do have a witchy subplot in a novel that I will be writing later this year, which will come out probably next year or maybe the year after. Um, where I'm looking at the legacy because it, what happened with the witches was when they were accused and when they were tried, um, your whole family was sort of tarred with that brush um, and it was very dangerous actually to stand up for your relations. So you would see your mother accused as a daughter, you wouldn't be able to say I'd, she didn't do it because then you would be accused. Um, so it, it really ripped through families and this sense of shame and, and um, I think they're probably a lot of women in that sort of subsequent centuries had sort of a form of post-traumatic stress um, mm -hmm. because this had happened to them there had been nothing they were able to do about it um, and then that 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 story kind of dogged you and dogged your kids and maybe even your grandkids if you stayed in the local area everyone knew your granny was a witch and was burned as a witch uh, or killed as a witch so um yeah I, I it, one of my characters has a great grandma who was a witch uh, and has been sort of carrying this with her. So yeah, it's it's definitely part of my understanding of women's sense of themselves historically, particularly within Scotland, because we had really terrible witch trials. We had among, you know, amongst the worst in Europe, there were a couple of witch trials in sort of German states that were kind of as bad, but our average, oh, we were five times worse than the average. We killed five times more people per head of population than, than was kind of average. So we had a pretty awful time. Yeah, um, just for a quick reminder, in case anyone's just joined us, um, do feel free to put any questions in the chat below. And we're here talking with Sarah Sheridan about where the women are going to match in Scotland. Um, so, Sarah, what I was thinking of was, um, sorry, just one second. Um, you've got loads of statues and plaques in the book, but you also, for example, with the witches, you have created kind of monuments that are less traditional. Um, yeah. Although there are fictionalised statues, um, plaques, as I say, um, could you give us a couple of examples of the created monuments and why you chose to go down that road with specific women rather than repeating maybe what we actually see in the built environment around us today? Yeah, I think it was uh, it, at the start, it was just like, oh, another cairn, another statue. What can I do that makes this book really brings it to life? I mean, I'm a novelist to trade. Uh, and so it's about um, getting inside somebody else's imagination and being able to make them see this. And so I, I started to think of monuments that would really chime with people that they would be able to visualize really easily and also you know we do mem memorialize men with statues and benches and plaques and all of that but but we also do it in buildings and in festivals and in other ways so I wanted to to do that with regard to the witches um I came up with a monument that is actually a historic environment Scot Scotland property so it's a wrecked church um, which is in the middle of the countryside. And I created a, a, a witch, witch's memorial trail that led to this church, which was a, which was burnt out. And so my idea was that the church would, um, it would smell of this burnt out wood and that inside there would be a lot of herbs growing and herbs hung up so that it would be like a smell monument. It would be something that you could visit. It would have an amazing atmosphere and it was kind of I suppose fitting that it was a burnt out church because the because so many women had died um, after being uh, convicted by the the church sessions mm -hmm. so um yeah that kind of thing was something that i thought yeah i can see that that's an amazing idea and i worked with a a, a perfumer called um alex musgrave he's a very talented perfumer and i said to him what should i put in this church to make it smell amazing and so he helped me choose the um the, the the right stuff to put in there so that you would walk in and it would have a really distinctive kind of witchy smell mm -hmm. um so certainly that one 
things like bells. You know, I love bells. I, I, I put a couple of bells up on Shetland and somebody wrote to me at one point and said, this would drive us all nuts. It's very windy up here, you know. <laughs> Mrs. Bell was just going to constantly be chiming. And I suppose that's the joy of, of, of making up monuments rather than having to actually, um, actually create them is that, you know, it's easy peasy because you don't have to deal with, you know, the noise level or anything. I, I suppose one of my favourites, one of my other favourites was uh, in the Highlands and I decided to make a memorial to the women who were cleared, the Highland clearances. Uh, and women very often were very active in standing up to the Highland clearances, almost in a sense more than the men. So um, there are a lot of women who were injured or killed as a result of, of that kind of action. And I looked internationally, actually, at um, the kind of monuments that are made all around the world to that kind of injustice. Um, and I chose to echo a Holocaust memorial, actually, uh, in Germany, which is a, a huge piece of, wood, of stone. And I thought this is perfect for the Highlands. It's kind of perfect for this because all the crofts were, were built of stone. And so it's a massive piece of Highland stone, as big as a big house. Um, and it's put in soggy ground and it is going to sink into the soggy ground over hundreds of years. And on the underside are carved the names of the women and the names of the crofts and the people who live there. And um, so that they are sinking back into the ground of the Highlands. And I, I love that idea. And lastly, um, uh, I, I, I made a monument to the Queens of Scotland and I made it at Dunfermline Abbey. And so when you go into Dunfermline Abbey, you go into this kind of a long hallway, a long reception hallway room at, in the Abbey. Uh, and the light is kind of amazing. And so I, I, I made a smoke monument, which um, has been done in a church in Venice for the Venice Biennale about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just a spiral of smoke that goes up um, and uh, up to the roof. And that, and that was my monument for the Queens of Scotland. So yeah, lots and loads and loads of different ideas. And, and um, I hope it helps people really visualize and also captures a bit of the essence of the women. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It just gives it a bit more personality, doesn't it? And kind of um, more of a direct connection to what they actually did or they actually achieved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's cool. Is there, are there any um, existing statues in Scotland of women that you do think are particularly noteworthy or anything that sticks in your mind yeah i mean there's quite a few glasgow's got seven or eight now i think um because they've, they've just put up a couple of new ones to the the rent strike women um my favorite one in glasgow is not to a scottish woman it's la passionara which is down on the clyde and it is to dolores um who is a oh, they, oh yeah uh, dolores aburi who is a a a, a Spanish Civil War uh, sort of icon. Uh, lots and lots of people from Glasgow, including women, um, went to uh, fight against fascism. There was a lot of anti-fascists who went from Scotland to the to the, to fight in the Civil War. And also, we mustn't forget there were a lot of women who were left at home. Their, their husbands went off to fight, and they were left in a situation where they had to run the house and look after the kids and do all of that on their own. I, I love this statue. Um, and when I'm in Glasgow, quite often if I'm in the centre of town enough time, I'll grab a coffee and go down. There's a bench nearby and you can go and sit next to Dolores. So I love I love it because she looks so joyful, I suppose. I think that's my that's my favourite one. We had a question from Sabrina on Facebook, um, kind of asking if there's any other projects worldwide I suppose were either inspired by your book or doing something similar or tangential and if any other countries are starting to put women in the picture more is that something you've kind of become aware of over the last couple of years? Yeah and I think there's a worldwide movement and I mean my agent has pitched to do the same kind of thing in Ireland. I lived in Ireland for many years and studied at Trinity and, and so my agent was talking to an Irish publisher but no takers so far so people could say oh it's an amazing idea oh I don't know if I want it but they should have it I think um, and, and certainly there was a, a feature in the Irish Times that very much played on the idea of the book and said if we were putting up monuments where would we put it up and it it came out just before the book came out and I know they had a copy and the, I had spoken to the journalist who, who wrote it so um yeah I think there are there, there's kind of an, an increasing awareness around the world uh that that women's stories have not been on it and haven't been told so I think it I, I'm part of that more general movement um and I hope that people um are inspired by the book certainly you know after it came out I had I was contacted by several Scottish councils who said, we're really interested in your book. Can we use the material? And mm -hmm. my answer was always yes, because that's our history. <laughs> you know, I didn't make the woman up. They're real. They're, you, they belong to you. 
a part of your history. Uh, and so I think it was really helpful for them, though, to see which women came from their area. Mm -hmm. Perhaps something that hadn't been researched. And a couple of ME, uh, MSPs came back to me and said, oh, I see is this person in my in my constituency, you know, and, um, and we had a chat about where they actually lived and, 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 and where they came from. So I think what it's done is allowed um, some people who might be interested in putting up monuments and renaming things or putting up benches and stuff to see where who lived where. Yeah, because it can be localized, can't it? The, the kind of commemoration you want it to be someone from the place that you are. Um, internationally, yeah, the Irish thing. Um, uh, uh, but apart from that, no, I haven't heard any more. But I would be surprised. I mean, I got the idea from Rebecca Solnit. I hope somebody gets the idea from me. That's that's what ideas are for. Yeah, I think what you're saying about um, finding out if people are from your area is really interesting because. Um, one of the women that sticks out in my head is Rebecca West, who appears in the book. And although I'd heard of her and she'd, you know, she reported on Nuremberg trials and things like that, as well as being an author, I wasn't aware she had a connection to Scotland until I read where the women realised she had um, a part of her education here. So I think as well as unknown women, you will find just women who were present in Scotland that you perhaps just were unaware of up till now. So yeah, you do. Really it's not a terrible novel because after I'd finished, I looked at a lot of the writers and I'd, I'd, I'd written about them in the book and I was like, and I made a list and I decided to read through some of their books, um, including Lorna Moon. Um, I'd never read Mary Brunton before. I'd never read Susan mm -hmm. before. I'd never read Dorothy Stevenson before, Robert Louis Stevenson's second cousin, um, who sold a lot more books than he did in her lifetime. Anyway. Um, and so I, 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 I went off and read Rebecca West and her nonfiction, that's what she was known for, was brilliant, mm -hmm. also wrote a terrible novel. And I remember getting halfway through this novel thinking, I'm just giving this up, Rebecca. <laughs> so, yeah, it was quite, it's quite interesting to just see what everyone tried, you know, as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The, the, sort of the range of skills and achievements that people had, maybe not everything worked out, but people really were not mm -hmm. just doing one thing. For their yeah, life, yeah, lots of things, exactly. and that was lovely actually to find out more about people that you already knew about, like Mary Somerville or Rebecca West or Wilhelmina Fleming, the the astronomer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I already these were people I already knew, like you, but that I didn't know that they had a connection here. And and Rebecca West was, you know, her schooling was here, so she was brought up in Scotland in Edinburgh I think, somewhere. Yeah, got a question from Antonia on YouTube. Um, you mentioned there are notable terrible Scottish women. Yeah. Who's your favourite? Who's your favourite Scottish female baddie? Oh my god, female baddies. Um, Lady Anne Mackintosh was pretty awful, but also quite admirable. So she was Jacobite, noble woman, and um, she was sort of key to the rout of Moy. So when the when um, the Hanoverians were coming to attack she was one of the people who sort of masterminded the idea of making it sound in the dark like there were a lot of Jacobites and I think there was something ridiculous like 15 Jacobites and a thousand Hanoverians but she but they scared them away but she also um recruited for the Jacobite cause amongst her tenants and threatened to evict their families and burn out their homes if they didn't if the men didn't join up so she was a she was a bit of a baddie I mean Mary Stopes is another one both good and bad. So Mary Stopes wrote Married Love. She probably enabled women uh, in terms of contraception, you know, um, advice and, and um, gynecological sort of advice um, through her book Married Love, which was massive at the beginning of the, the 20th century, that sort of early mid 20th century era. But she was a eugenicist. Oh, well, wow. so quite often you you find her and you think, oh, these well, this woman's amazing, and then you're like, oh no, she's done this terrible thing, or she's got this terrible opinion mm. um, uh, as well. So yeah, I, I like Mary Stopes in terms of you know she, in terms of impact, she positively impacted so many women, and yet was so very morally wrong. <laughs> Um, we've got a couple of questions on sort of existing statues. So this is Nick on YouTube, just mm -hmm. asking if you knew to hand how many Queen Victoria statues there are. So I thought, I know there's quite a lot, aren't there? So Victoria is the most memorialised woman in the UK. About 15% of statues in the UK are to women, and, and most of those are to Victoria. Not just statues as well, street names and um, hallways and, you know, all mm -hmm. kinds. 
stuff. Um, she loved a statue and people used to suck up to her by putting up a statue or naming something after her. In Edinburgh, we have a Victoria at the bottom of Leith Walk. We have Victoria Street. We have a Victoria on top of the gallery at the bottom of the mound. I didn't even know it was there actually until I wrote this book and suddenly looked up and there she was smiling down at me. Not part of the original design, which is Georgian, but you know, louped up there uh, to suck up to her basically because I think they wanted something from her. The one on the screen at the moment is in Glasgow in George Square. She's the only woman in the square. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, she's the most memorialized woman. And after her UK wide, the next most memorialized is Wendy from Peter Pan, who is of course fictional. But there are a number of Wendy statues mm -hmm. that are much loved um, as well. So. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know an absolute number, but she, she's the most common uh, female mm. in the UK and in Scotland. I think in the Glasgow chapter, you actually put up a lot of suffragettes in George Square. Yeah, that that's right? cool. they'll be keeping Victoria company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it, there were a lot of Glasgow suffragettes, and, and Dundee was great for suffragettes. My favourite suffragette, though, was actually Irish, although she lived in. Scotland, her name was Dorothy Maloney, although she was commonly known as Dolly or Mary Maloney. And um, she was up in Dundee during 1908, which was Churchill's by-election. And mm -hmm. Churchill was trying to speak and Mary was on a platform ringing a bell so that she was drowning him out because he refused to talk about the suffrage for women. And she said, well, if you're not going to talk about that, then you're not going to talk about anything. And um, she was, he was pretty pretty strident <laughs> so she's my yeah. favorite <laughs> the bell is a strong move definitely <laughs> um let's see um sorry i'm just looking up this question here so um lisa on facebook asked so many places are named after so Walter, so sir walter scott or about his books um mm. are there any you particularly right, like to rename and i know there's a couple of instances in edinburgh that you renamed Walter yeah, Scott. Yeah, I redid the Scott Monument and I redid Waverley Station to be about Susan Ferrier. So Susan was a contemporary of Scott. She was the youngest of the Ferrier sisters. Um, Robert Burns wrote a poem to the Ferrier sisters. There were nine of them. They lived in Edinburgh, in central Edinburgh, and they also had a country place in Morningside, which sounds mad to us, but it was outside the city at this point. Um, and she was contemporary of Scott, and Scott liked her work. So when her first book came out, it was published anonymously, and Sir Walter Scott was accused of writing it. She was, And he said, no, 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 this is written by somebody who's actually a much better writer than I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I, in Edinburgh, I took down the Scott Monument and I put up the Ferrier Arch, which is like a triumphal arch. Uh, and um, I, I put a little figure of Sir Walter on the Ferrier Arch because he supported Susan Ferrier. Scott, Scott was actually quite a good ally to other female writers. Um, and actually anyone in education, he was a big educationalist. I recently discovered he bought a school teacher in Shetland a piano that she needed and had it shipped up to her. I mean, he was that he was kind of, you know, great ally, really. Um, Waverly after Susan Ferrier's novel Destiny, because I like the idea mm -hmm. of great. getting off the train at Destiny, uh, your destiny. So I instead of Waverly Station, Edinburgh's Destiny Station for Susan Ferrier. And that's just what I did in Edinburgh, really. Yeah, I think that's, um, I think we saw it earlier, but we've got a good illustration in the book of the Ferrier Arch, just mm. so people can imagine what that would look like if they were walking down Princess Street. Um, I was also wondering, um, how did you find researching sort of, um, sort of the Highlands and Islands in terms of the Gaelic research that you did? Mm. It's quite difficult because I, I lived in the Giltacht in Ireland for about two years, so I have a smattering of Irish Gaelic, but no real Scottish Gaelic to speak to so I just had to ask people and get some help and it was great working with Historic Environment Scotland because you have actual people who speak Gaelic so you have native speakers on your staff who are prepared to come in and check my terrible Gaelic spelling and uh, misunderstanding of it so there were a lot of um, female medieval Gaelic poets um, that I was really interested to hear about mm -hmm. uh, and to read some of their work actually uh, as well um, I can't remember, uh, so sort of Highlands and Islands, that sort of stuff. And, and just asking people, you know, it, it, you can't be an expert in the whole thing for this book. Mm -hmm. 
a way to be an expert yeah. in the whole thing. So there are two areas I write about. I write about the mid 20th century. I write a series of murder mysteries. And I know a lot about women in the mid 20th century. And I know quite a lot mm-hmm. about women in the late Georgian, early Victorian. But I knew that I didn't know anything about medieval women. <laughs> I put yeah. my hand up to it. And so it was just a matter of going out, reading some books, talking to people. And, and the biographies are not hugely detailed. Um, we only needed a paragraph about each, but I wanted to feel that I had some sense of what that woman had achieved and, and why she might be memorialised before I wrote about her. So mm-hmm. there was quite a lot of research to do. Absolutely. Gallic poetry, people were reading Gallic poetry to me down the phone and it's just dreamy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. There's a woman, um, I probably will pronounce this wrong, apologies, but um, Mary Moore Nan Oren, who's in the book, and she, there's a quote in the book where she says we should study our witches as well as our saints. And I, I just think <laughs> really great quote and kind of encompasses the fact, again, like the breadth of this book and it sort of adds a layer of texture to knowledge about women. You won't remember every single woman in this book, but when they crop up in a newspaper article or a podcast or on TV, you're like, I've heard of that woman. And mm. You're like, oh, yes, I know where it was. It was where the women and it just sort of gives you extra depth to what you know really i'm still finding women i hate to say this christine if we go to another edition (laughs) i keep a a file on my computer that's called more women and it's in the where are the women folder on my dropbox and you know every so often you somebody on social media mentions a woman or i read an article about one say oh my god there's another amazing scottish woman and i take a little note just in case we can get her in somewhere i think at one point i did a thread of women i discovered who just couldn't make it didn't make it into the book but Mm -hmm. they were absolutely amazing um so yeah we're not we're not short of fantastic foremothers for sure absolutely absolutely and a question from colin on facebook um, what would your prediction be for the influence of present day gender neutral, um, neutrality policy be sort of looking at women's history in 50 years time? So what will our contemporary culture I think look we have like a lot more world. We have a lot more words. We have a lot more language. I mean, that's certainly something that I notice. I'm not even historical. It's terrible, isn't it? When part of your upbringing becomes historical. I'm 53 this year. And I think of the kind of communication and the words that we had, just the language that we had and the understanding of stuff that we had when I was growing up. And I'm actually quite jealous of my daughter and my nieces that they have all this new language to discuss what they feel and who they are. Um, So yeah, I hope uh, that we take that on. That's progress, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think one of the interesting things was you know, it was quite difficult in some cases to figure out, for example, early 20th century lesbians, because there were some women who were obviously gay. I mean, there was just no way they weren't gay. And there were other women that you were like, well, are you or aren't you? I don't know. I don't quite understand. Mm-hmm. Because they did, because there was no language, even in their diaries, you know, they quite often just don't have the language. And you, you discover these beautiful early lesbian poems. Um, there's a, a woman called Bessie Craig Mile from uh, Aberdeen who wrote poetry to her lover, who, who went off and married a man. So she was absolutely raging about it. It's this tragic, tragic set of poems by Bessie Craig Mile. Mm-hmm. Um, we, have, we have language for that today. Thank God we have language for that today. So yeah, I hope, um, I, I hope it continues to enlighten our understanding really of where we really come from, which mm-hmm. is what poetry is all about for me. It's about finding out where we come from uh, and, that's that's the joy of it. Absolutely. I was thinking that earlier when we had the question about how you would sort of speak to children about it and you hope that perhaps it won't be such a big question that just for everything that's happening, there will be more representation. Yeah. And also, I, mean, I, I learn when children speak to me. Like mm. I'm not teaching kids anymore. They're teaching me. And that's very difficult to listen to sometimes. You know, you were campaigning in the 80s and in the 90s about stuff that, you know, you, you and, and things change, things move on. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel quite strongly about it, actually. It's listening skills. Mm. That's where our understanding comes from. Uh, we need to learn to listen. We've got a question from Helen on YouTube asking, how can we future-proof women's contribution so that researchers can, researchers can access information on women much more easily? Um. Okay, so I think there are a number of things that are being done and can be supported and we can do more of um, initiatives in academia around uh, funding PhD research, which is the 
beginning of lots of other things that happen and making that PhD research digitally available is really important. Initiatives like the National Dictionary, uh, a biographical dictionary of Scottish women to keep funding that, to update that so that we can do that. And one of the hugest things, this is really going to make you angry. I know it is. It made me angry when I found out about it. So when they started Wikipedia, the first load of sort of um, criteria that they they made their algorithm from was from the Encyclopedia Britannica. And Encyclopedia Britannica was curated and put together by white middle-aged Christian men. Uh, and so when they extrapolated what had got into the Encyclopedia Britannica, they just made that part of Wikipedia and what Wikipedia will put up. Uh, and so it, Wikipedia's algorithm is a bit sexist, let's put it like that. And mm. so there are a lot of wiki editing um, uh, sort of uh, work going on that you can join and quite often libraries get involved with this and, and women's groups and all different kinds of people get involved in it with different expertises to 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 put that into Wikipedia because that's like one of the, the most important resources actually for young people. Young people don't go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, they go to Wikipedia. Um, uh, and, and so uh, it's problematic and it's something that a number of people are working on and they're always looking for people to come on wiki edit so that we can include more women and then uh projects like on this day she which is uh started out as a social media project to um to memorialize different women every day uh and it's now a book that's just come out called on this day she so um getting that supported within the sort of publishing world really to make these stories really accessible um, and, and, and more well known. I think all these things actually um, will help to will help in the future. Absolutely and we'll just have to keep on sharing all the stories within the book as well. Yes. Sure we'll get to hear these untold stories in one way or another. Um, so I think we're really kind of coming to the end of our um, chat this evening so I would just like to really thank everyone who's taken the time to join us this evening. Um, it's been really great to talk to Sarah. If you would like more Where Are the Women, as I mentioned at the start, it is just out on paperback now. So I'm sure there'll be links below. It's generally available, including from the Historic Environment Scotland shop. There's also throughout March, um, it's Women's History Month. If you follow HES on Twitter, social media, you'll get a lot of stories about Scotland's women also on the blogs we've got an online exhibition opening on monday for international women's day so there's loads of stories out there i'm sure that you'll find really interesting and um, i'd also like to thank my hs colleagues behind the scenes for letting everything run so smoothly and finally just a big thank you to you sarah for giving us these insights into where are the women a guide to imagine scotland and introducing us to so many women that we may not have met before Thank you. Lovely chatting to you again. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, so thank you very much.